Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 37, The Spirit of Competition. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Today, Sean and I are going to be having a conversation about competition in games. After that, I've got my RPG a month review for March, The Demon Lord's Companion for Shadow of the Demon Lord. And I've got a blog post of my own to promote. Then we're going to dive into Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we will talk about my weekend spent in Windsor and the many games we played. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions, feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part of, and so on. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can always hit us up on social media as well, where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Evil John left a comment on the blog about our Race for the Galaxy review. It's funny how Symbol System is listed as one of the ugly parts of the game. Perhaps in 2009 I would have thought the same thing, but I see this type of instructional gameplay iconography everywhere these days. I think Race for the Galaxy actually taught me how to read this new and interesting language. Mm. This is something I am thankful to have learned. Well, thanks for the comment, John. Well, I do agree that I do dig iconography in most games, uh, especially being able to make games language independent, makes them cheaper for all of us. I just found a race for the galaxy. It's just a bit too much. There's just too many icons trying to tell you too many things. Now, Martin Voss also mentioned the iconography in Race for the Galaxy over on MeWe. I like the symbols, and the rarer ones get explained on the cards. I do remember a joke about Race for the Galaxy, that the quick reference sheet itself needs a quick reference sheet. It's easy once you get the hang of it, but it looks incredibly intimidating. Thanks, Martin. I have to say, in hindsight, that the iconography was really one of the major stalling points for me in learning, especially online. Now, once I had the cards in my hand, it was a little less daunting, but still, especially once the expansions jump in, it escalates quickly to a staggering level of, of little things to keep track of. Now, one final Race for the Galaxy comment from Jeffrey Jones. I think Roll for the Galaxy is a better game, but Race is a great game, not only for its gameplay, but also for its portability. Well, thanks, Jeffrey. Well, I like Roll for the Galaxy. I find myself coming back to Race for the Galaxy way more often. I play race daily now, thanks to Board Game Arena, and I can't remember the last time I actually broke out my copy of Roll from the Galaxy. Now, I will admit, for introducing new gamers, Roll for the Galaxy is a little bit more user-friendly and a little less intimidating for new players. Up next, I wanted to share a couple comments from our last episode about gaming at weddings. Chris Groff wrote, Think if I suggested board games at our wedding, there probably wouldn't have been a wedding. I guess I would have been playing board games, though. Thanks, Chris. You do have to know your audience. I know mine would have been problematic as it flies in the face of the traditional wedding my wife had always wanted, but I sincerely hope we are slowly moving into an era where weddings can be more flexible and less about older family members' expectations and more about the mm -hmm. happy couple themselves. Now, Naomi Lucier wrote on Facebook, My friends Matt and Tracy did this. There was a whole table of games. It was great. Some people don't dance and this was a wonderful option for us. The games were out for the whole reception, and our table played all night. I will absolutely be doing this if I ever have a big wedding reception. Great comment, Naomi. I'm glad to hear someone has done it, and it worked. So there is hope for you gamers out there to possibly have some games at your wedding. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show and sometimes have some special features that might make it up on YouTube. Thanks to our moderator, Anshi Games. Tonight in the chat, we have a good crowd. We've got another TTV, another TTV viewer, Banana Nanana, 
Brian's in there, Dragon Gem, Poncho, Shadzar, and Tech are all joining us so far. Excellent. Um, Good to see a, a, a growing group. I like to see more and more people in there every week. Absolutely. An electrical longboard just showed up on mine, although I'm guessing that one's a bot. Possibly. You know, anything electrical just makes me think bot, but it could be people's names. Of course, I thought Tech was a bot at first until he started to speak up, so you never know. Absolutely. So tonight we're talking about competition, head to head, people who take it to their heads and possibly take it too seriously. For those of you in the chat, what I want to know is how competitive are you? And have you had problems playing with people that take games too seriously? Or possibly are you one of those people that has a hard time just enjoying the fun of the game? We'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. We are here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask a Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. While we prefer to get questions through the website, we're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we're going to discuss a topic uh, from a question, or rather a series of questions, sent in by Tabletop Bellhop patron Brian Kurtz about competition at the game table. So we're going to handle this one uh, a little different than usual. Uh, this is a big topic. It's actually a big question. Once we get to it, you'll see it. It's one of the longest questions we've gotten. A uh, very thoughtful question. And it's one I strongly think is worth actually talking about and discussing. So instead of our usual format where people ask me to recommend a few games or look for my personal opinion on some hints and tips, where I can, I'll go and I'll answer it on the blog first and I'll write up a full blog post and then we'll take that and I'll put it into the show notes and Sean and I will basically discuss what we already talked about on the blog. Because this is such a big topic, I wanted to have the conversation first. I thought it was worth having Sean and I sit and talk about this and kind of work through it uh, as I don't think just hearing my opinion is going to be as valid as having a full discussion on it and kind of digging into this. So this is a little different than what we've done in the past. It's going to be a more open discussion. And then I'm going to write the blog post after the fact. Now, one extra thing, what I would love to know for those of you listening to this, how does this format work for you? Like I'm considering if this turns out well, maybe this is what we'll do going forward. All right. And here's what Brian wrote. Hi, Mo and Sean. As you know, I'm a tabletop bellhop mega fan. I've loved your show from the very first episode, from your patient explanations of different mechanics and games to reviews and recommendations. I've gotten a lot out of the show and the website. I've bought some fantastic games on your recommendation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank my you. Que my question today is a little different than some of the other questions you've had, which look for specific suggestions of games that meet certain crit criteria. Mine is a bit more philosophical. I want to know what you think about competition and gaming. While I encourage you to go whatever that vague prompt takes you in your discussion, the source of the question comes from some experiences I've had watching friends or acquaintances get nasty in competitive situations. Dating back from my childhood playing Monopoly or Atari games and observing the sore loser phenomenon in a family member or peers, to the first time I played Settlers of Catan in the late 90s, trying to weather the mood storms of children, and sometimes grown-ups, who struggle with competition. I've been struck by just how bad this can get. As two people who game with family, friends, acquaintances, and strangers all the time, what insights do you have into this phenomenon? How do you anticipate when competitive, competitiveness can go awry and head it off at the pass? How do you handle people who want to game, but aren't good at checking their zest for winning when the situation requires it? Do you have any rules, explicit or implicit, that set the tone for gaming at your house or your events? Apart from sticking strictly to cooperative games, any tips for choosing games based on what you know about your fellow gamers and their ability to handle competition? Thanks, guys. Brian. Okay, so now after hearing that, you can probably see why I thought this was worth having more of an open discussion about. So first off, thanks, Brian, so much for the great topic. Uh, there's a lot to break down here. And I think the be best place to start would be on our personal levels of competitiveness. Where do we stand on this scale? So, Sean, how competitive would you say you are? I actually have quite a strong competitive streak in me. Uh, but over the years, I've recognized that and worked really hard to balance that. It does emerge in some forms, but when it comes to gaming, um, it really doesn't. I look at gaming as a social activity and not a competition. 
And when I've set in that mindset uh, and settled down there, it's really not a big deal to me either way. Now, I, I've said it many times. People have asked me this many times over the years because I play a lot of games. I run tournaments. I teach games. I've been a gamer for a long time. And what I have always answered is that I don't care if I win, but I always play to win. So when I am sitting down to play a board game, I am going to try my hardest to play the best I can. The thing is, I don't care what the end result of that is. So if I try my hardest and lose, I'm not going to be frustrated. If I try my hardest and win, I'm not going to gloat about it. For me, actually, the fun of the game is, as Sean mentioned, the social interaction, the playing the game with other people, the chit-chatting, the interactions we have during the game. The actual score at the end, to me, is just, I'll, icing on the cake if it matters at all now i will admit now and then if there's certain games i'm good at if there are slight pride in taking it well like i'm still 100 percent undefeated at zolkin and i'm kind of proud of that fact but then I've, i don't think i've ever beat deanna a game of trajan ever and i don't think i ever will but i'm still more than happy to play it with her so I don't really care one way or the other for me it's about playing the game but play to win i don't enjoy playing with people who don't care about competition at all and who just goof around and who do silly moves and just do the the dumb thing that's fun we have a couple local gamers who are like that and i admit i don't enjoy playing with them i expect everyone else at the table to at least try to win now the other thing is tournaments are a totally different thing. So if I'm playing a game and it's just a game night at my house, or I'm at the local game store, or I'm at a coffee shop or wherever, or even at a con, I'm just playing the game. But if it's a tournament, that's totally different. If there is a prize involved and it's set up as a competition, I'm gonna take things more seriously. Now, the one thing I will not do, and I have played with people like this, is I won't do everything to win. Like I have played with a local gamer who will make suggestions for other players. Oh, on your turn, you should do this. And maybe you should do that. Well, it ends up what he's recommending are actual bad moves that are only good for them. And to me, that seems manipulative and skeevy, and I'm not a fan of doing that. I won't do anything to win. I'm, I'm going to let you play your game. I'm going to play my game. And if we're in a competition, I'm going to try to win as hard as I can. Yeah, and I think we're, we're mostly on the same page. Um... I, I probably, because I don't play quite as much, I, I probably actually am now a little bit less competitive in gaming. Uh, and there mm -hmm. are games, uh, I can, I, my first thought that comes to mind is uh, Bonanza when we were down for your birthday. Mm -hmm. It gets a little goofy and I don't mind being in on the goof. Uh, you won that one because I think you were the only one who was actually taking that game seriously. <laughs> yeah. But that was more a, a matter of the game and who was at the table. Um, and the fact that I couldn't even remember how to play it until we start, until we got rolling. Um, so I don't mind a little bit of, of goofing around in the right game. Again, Bonanza right. is one of those games where things can just get silly really fast if, if a couple of people are willing to let it get that way. Uh, whereas um, I think a lot of other games don't necessarily have that level of silliness in there um, to, uh, to burn it out. So yeah, Brian mentioned in the chat room, sabotage. That's exactly it. I am not a fan of sabotage. Um, there, there's other thing. Okay, so another thing that comes up in competition for gamers is king making. So king making is when one player can't win. So they deliberately make someone else win or make someone else lose, right? So say, Sean, Deanna and I are playing, and it's the three of us, and I realize I can't win. And well, Deanna always wins, so I don't want her to win, so I'm going to make Sean win. Now, that's something else I'm not a big fan of. I, in some situations, it's hard not to play that way. Personally, I am against king making. I think king making, again, even if you're going to come in third, it's going to be a game with score. Try to get the best score you can. And what I find I do is when I get in those positions where I know I can't win is when that's when I'll do the silly moves. That's when I'll um, experiment. That's when I'll try something different, right? So I, it's Terraforming Mars. I'm halfway through the game. There's no way I'm going to win because someone's already got winning all the way with greenery. So I'm like, forget it. I'm going to try something I've never done before and build every space event I can possibly do. Now, I'm just pulling this off the top of my head. I don't even know if that's something you can validly do in Terraforming Mars. But it's one of those where I'm going to try something different and I'll play with it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, to me, I, I, again, a lot of these games, I'm still new to them. I think the majority of games I play with you guys, uh, it's the first time I've played them. So I yeah. go in with zero expectation of winning playing against you and D. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean I'm going to just sort of give up and not do anything. 
because uh, a lot of what I can take out of that gameplay is, well, okay, I'm not going to win, but I still want to learn the game so that if mm -hmm. I do get it down at the table again, I'm going to know and I'm going to be better at it. And if I just throw away or goof off or whatever, I'm not learning anything. Uh, so I'm just going to get trounced the next time I play it too. <laughs> right. and, and then it becomes not fun because I didn't put the effort into learning that game. Uh, and so that's one thing that I find is, you know, if you're, even if you're only playing it once and it's someone else's game, that's when you need to at least at the very least pay attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Even if you're losing, you know, there needs to be some th thought process going on focused on that game to make sure that you're getting something out of it and you're not taking away anything from the other players. Yeah, very true. So I'm going to read something uh, Deanna just wrote in the chat room because it's very applicable to this Kingmaker thing I just mentioned. So she notes, uh, there are a few local gamers have who have an overdeveloped white knight attitude where they're like, you as the female should win. So I'll play Kingmaker and give it to you. And she's noting how that just makes her cringe, that that's just horrible. Like, just don't do that, right? And I know exactly who she's talking about. And it's it's one of those things. King king making is, is to be avoided if at all possible. Now, I'm not saying, uh, what would you call it? Chase the leader, I think is valid, right? So if there's the fact that this person's winning, go chase the leader, right? Go after the, the point leader, attack them because that gives you a better chance of winning is totally valid. And some some games are badly designed so that if you do that, if you chase the leader, you're basically king making for second place. Now that to me is a problem with the game, not the players. Uh, I guess if you know the game really well, you'd have to go for second place first, then first or whatever. But anyway, that's getting off topic a bit. So one of the things that's worth mentioning, Sean's noting about playing games new. One of the things I think is very important to cut off competition before it gets started is those learning games. Uh, we talked about this back on our teaching games episode, that the first time you play a game, it's a learning game. Don't consider the score. Don't even worry about winning. Don't even worry about the points at the end. Who cares who wins? The point of that first game is to learn to play. And those are the games where I want you to experiment. Those are the ones as a teacher where I'm going to try the screwiest strategy I've ever thought of because I don't care if I win because as far as I'm concerned like this game doesn't count all we're trying to do is play the extreme version because you know you're going to play the extreme version so the next time you can play it with the rules correctly and uh, Shadzar brings up a good point regarding role playing um, he will occasionally fudge things for new players in a role playing game and I have to say while I do not agree with that in board gaming in board gaming <laughs> don't fudge things in role playing absolutely it's too easy to go for that TPK in a role-playing game and that new player will just be done and never come back. Um, whereas in a board game, you know, people, you know, if you're going to be playing board games, you need to be understand that sometimes you're going to lose and that's part mm -hmm. of the game. Uh, whereas that, that whole early death in uh, role-playing, I find, can really drag down a player's interest uh, when once you get used to it, it's not a big deal. Well, heck, look at my first D&D experience, which I've shared before, that had me swear I would never play a game with the words Dungeons & Dragons in it, and I kept that promise for 10 years because of a bad experience. Yep. So talking about fudging dice and D&D will leave for another topic. That's, yep. that's a whole that's a episode. Whole other... A whole uh, can of worms we're not going to open here tonight because I have strong thoughts on that one. Yep. So right. to expand on the teaching game, the big thing about that, right, what I just explained about the teaching game is something that's very important sitting down to any table to play any game with anyone, whether that's a board game, a role playing game, or you're sitting down to start your first LARP, is setting expectations before the game starts. That is something that sometimes people forget and skip and don't think about. When I sit down with a new group of players, I will always point out what type of game it is we're about to play. So if I'm set up at the CG Realm, a good example of this, a couple weekends ago, there was a group on Facebook wanted to play heavier games. So I brought, a, brought out a copy of Arkwright and we did not have enough, we had enough people to play, but we didn't have the full complement. And I had a couple people come by and kind of look at the game curiously. And I'm like, okay, if you want to play, you're welcome to play. But look, this is a heavier game. It's going to take us three and a half to four hours people often talk about it being a spreadsheet game where you have to do a lot of math it's going to use a lot of familiar board game concepts that if you don't know already you're going to make this game really hard are you still interested in playing by doing that i had a heck of a lot of people go oh okay i'll move on and find a different game to play i did find two people i had never gamed with before they're like oh that's right my wheelhouse sat down played arc right now we're friends and now we play heavy games together now just like hey this is a teaching game 
don't worry about the score. Don't worry about anything. We're just here to learn. Hey, you know what? We're all friends here. I know this is Puerto Rico. I know there's strategies out there that are supposed to be the right way to play. That's not how we play here. That's not how this game's going to go. If you're still interested in playing, sure, sit down. Let's have a good time. But if you're more interested in a more competitive, strategic game, you know, there's another group over there that's really into that type of playing. Why don't you check out what they're doing? Absolutely. Uh, making sure everyone's aware early on is key. And now with that, that I go even earlier on to your kids and other people's kids. Uh, if you're playing with young kids, um, watch out and pay attention. Look for that early development of, of you know, wanting to get angry if things don't go their way. Um, it's a bad sign. And if things start going that way, again, we've said it before, it's okay to end a game. You know, mm -hmm. I would much rather end a game and talk about what's happened than have someone flip the table. You know, you just, in, in any in any form. Um, and uh, Anshi Games points out, I won't throw board games for my kids. I'm not going to throw them for a grown adult. And I feel exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. um, short of, uh, I, you know, I think we've talked, I, I've, I've shuffled the deck a little, or I've stacked the deck a little bit in some of the Harry Potter games because we're not sure if it's broken or not. But I've done that for me as well as them. I mean, again, that's a cooperative. I, I'm, not st I'm not stacking it for a player. That's the whole game I'm trying to break in house rule, basically, because we aren't sure if it's broken or not. But uh, my kids do not uh, do not get any special benefits from me. Chess, checkers, whatever it is. <laughs> so one of Brian's specific questions, I already got into this a little bit, is how do you anticipate when competitive can go awry and head it off at the pass? This is so actually a tough one if you don't know who you're, uh, if you don't know who you're playing with in advance. I mean, sometimes it's easy. You know, hey... I know him. I've watched him flip the table on games. I've watched him storm out angrily. You know, let's let's play a co-op with him. You know, <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. that, that might be one of the easier ones. But a lot of times you just don't know. Uh, and that's where it gets trickier. Yeah, here's it to me. This is again, that's about setting table expectations before the game starts. Right. Before you sit down and play, I'll explain to people. I'll say, hey, um, Hey, I, I'm Mo, I'm Mo Tuzo, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be teaching this game. And just so you know, like uh, I play to win, but I don't care about winning this game. I don't take things too seriously. Usually I'm running local events, right? So it's my usual WGR spiel, right? Like here at Windsor Gaming Resource Events, it's not about competition. It's about socializing, playing games together. So we were talking about how do, how do we anticipate when competitive can go awry and head it off at the pass? Uh, Sean had mentioned knowing the people you're playing with, if possible, and if not, there's not too much you can do. Um, I had suggested that whole before you start the game speech, right? The the whole make sure you everyone get buy in before you start playing, uh, buy in for the event too. So that's another thing worth noting. Uh, again, I run a lot of events, so I advertise those events on Facebook and I advertise them online. And uh, I used to do meetups, and I put it right in the meetup, right in the description that we are there just there to have fun. Uh, so it's important that people know that. We're not a tournament, right? So that's the big thing. Is point out that there, there is a time and a place, right, for competition. And I'm all for people playing competitive. And I am all for a group of four gamers coming to my house, sitting at the end of the table and saying, hey, we're going to take this seriously. We're going to play a competitive game. I want to see who's going to win. And there are certain people I game with that are like that. And... I have nothing against that. It's not necessarily what I want to do all the time, but sometimes I'm feeling that way too. I'm feeling competitive. Uh, we've mentioned Charles on the show multiple times. He is a local gamer who takes his gaming very seriously. And Charles usually, well, he again, like me, he always plays to win, but sometimes he takes the game more serious than others. It is nice to get him into a relaxing party style game now and then to show that, hey, he's not always about winning every time. But there is a thing locally about, hey, if you can beat Charles, you've done something, right? You've, you've, it's an accomplishment. To, to beat him because he's a he's a extremely intelligent man and a very good gamer so sitting down to play a game with charles does feel different so one of the other things i think you can do which is actually getting a bit into brian's next question is especially if you are running the event if you are at all involved if you're moderating if you're the host is set the competitive gamers up together so 
locally, I'm going to drop a couple names here, but if Mike Easterbrook and Charles both show up, I want to put them at the same table because both of them are all about playing the game to win. I might throw a Chris Ball in with them because Chris really likes to win, and he's one of those guys that between games will go on Board Game Geek and read up strategies, right? He's the one who's going to get upset that you're playing Puerto Rico wrong because there's certain opening moves you should be making, right? So I'm going to put those guys together. And the same thing if I go to the um, CD realm. So I talked about last week how we sat down and played Cypress Legacy. Well, before we played Cypress Legacy, we played something else. I don't even remember what. Now, oh, Builders of Blankenberg. So Builders of Blankenberg is a heavier, not heavy game, but heavier game. We finished our game of that, and we're trying to decide what to do next. So one guy, Chad, who played Builders of Blankenberg with us, wanted to play Great Western Trail. So that's a medium to heavy game. And I'm going to set up Cypress Legacy, a game with roll and move and miss a turns, right? So we had a local gamer, Holly, come over and Holly's like, oh, what's a Cypress Legacy? And I'm like, no, no, you want to go play Great Western Trail, right? Like you want to go play with Chad because Chad's playing a heavy game over there. They're going to take it very seriously. They're they're going to, you know, focus on their turns. There's going to be a lot of AP and you're going to enjoy that way more than us over here going, oh, I miss another turn. Oh, that's it. I'm sticking in the closet for three turns. And hey, look, I stole the badge from you, right? Two very different types of games. So it's matching the games to the players, I think, is a big part of this. Now, of course, as Sean mentioned, if you don't know the people, you're, you're kind of stuck. But that goes back again to our teaching game section where you have to find that common ground. You're going to interview people, right? It's not a job interview. It's a game interview. You're going to say, what kind of games are you into? Like, you're not gonna, are you overly competitive is not what you ask. But if the person's into games like Power Grid and... Um, they're going to a great Western trail power grid and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on heavy games and, and food chain magnet are the games they really enjoy. And they're really up for trying Indonesia. You're not going to put them at the table. That's about to start a game of cash and guns. Now, one thing, again, this goes with uh, <clears throat> the talking about teaching. Uh, one of the reasons I have found that people get angry and flip the board in those family games of monopoly is because People don't know how to play Monopoly. Um, the various house rules that everyone has at their own home and the various different ways of playing Monopoly that have evolved over the years don't work well together uh, and do tend to create this overly aggressive mm -hmm. style. Uh, so teaching that game properly uh, without house ruling it can make a big difference in some of that aggressiveness. Uh, you may not be able to dumb down the competitiveness, but the aggressiveness, mm -hmm. uh, which is that next, that sort of that step beyond competitiveness, that a lot of times the correct rules and correct playing can help to ease. Yeah, and some games even include different sets of rules for different competition levels. So for example, the latest printing of Agricola, no, I said Agricola, not Agricola, of Agricola has the family edition is what you buy first, which doesn't have any of the cards in it. So it doesn't have any of the minor improvements or I forget what the other cards are, family members, whatever. It doesn't have the cards, it's just the base game. And then there's the full game and the family game is less competitive because a lot of the cards have player interactions in them. Uh, Terraforming Mars, perfect example, is half the cards in the deck are for the Corporate Wars expansion, which is a lot more in your face, player versus player, aggression again the game's always competitive but adding those in make the game more interactive more face-to-face -face, more aggressive where the players are going to play against each other and i love seeing that in more modern games and again i this it all starts early on um i won't let my kids get all crazy about a game uh mm -hmm. if i see them starting to fight or about because one of them is losing and, and, uh, you know, even in connect four, we stop the game and it ends right there. And you, you have to cut it off at an early age before they get to the point where they think it's okay to mm -hmm. rant and rage and flip the table and be a poor winner or loser. Um, so, you know, again, we, those of you who are parents can, uh, can help your own kids. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about it. Anyone else's. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it all starts in your own home. So some of that does stretch into adulthood. If you are the moderator, the organizer, the host of an event, sometimes you got to put on the big person pants and break up a game that's getting there. Um, 
there are very few people I've ever had to remove from the Windsor Gaming Resource. And there was a game of Power Grid, which had me ask two people to leave because they took it too seriously. Uh, one of it was that sabotage. And that's exactly what had happened is the one player had strongly coerced another player into making a move that was bad for them. And the other player figured it out and got rather upset. And in one person's mind, it was the other person's fault. In my point of view, it was the one person's fault for sabotaging the other person's for overreacting and literally flipping a table at a Knights of Columbus. And I've had to ask these people to leave. Since then, I'm more cognizant of the fact this can be a problem because that before then, I'd just never seen it happen, right? I'd heard about these gamers who take things too seriously. What's the, the, the big heavy guy on YouTube that smashes it? I forget his name. There's all kinds of videos. They're faked, but it's like blah, 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 hates magic, Eric or something. And there's all these videos of this guy smashing card tables. Uh, like I thought that was an internet joke only right until i saw this guy literally flip a three by six table with power grid you know houses everywhere paper money flying through the air like a john woo movie right uh it was kind of nuts since i've seen that i'm more cognizant and really like you, you can as a host if you're hosting the event especially if it's at your house because it's your house but even if you're at the local game store if you're at the game store maybe it's somewhere where the staff can be called over if you're not comfortable doing it but like just hey People, calm down, take a minute, maybe go outside for a walk. You're taking this too seriously. Hey, it's just a game, all of that kind of stuff. And if the people blow up, maybe it's time to actually cause that game to stop. Now, I know organizers who do collectible card game events deal with this all the time. I know Shadzar had a couple talks earlier. Uh, I lost the whole chat, so I can't quote him directly, about people being overly manipulative, coercive, and basically jerks while playing Magic the Gathering. And that is definitely a problem in the competitive card scene uh, card game scene. It's it, there's a reason I don't bring my kids to the game store on Friday nights, despite the fact the game store is generally family friendly, doesn't allow swearing. Those games get heated and competitive, and sometimes people act in ways they probably shouldn't. Well, and and again, Shadzar did point out that you know the one with the most money tends to win in Magic, uh, and so there are problems related to that as well. You know, if you're, if you're the guy who can't afford the best deck, um, you may tend to get overly aggressive uh, in, you know, uh, as a, as a result of, of getting mm -hmm. stuck playing a whole bunch of uh, rich people who you just can't beat because they have more money than you. Um, and it's frustrating. Uh, and the, the key is, and one of the things to watch out for as an organizer is watch for that frustration. Uh, mm -hmm. Because more than anything, that's where the problem is going to emerge from. It may not be the source of the problem. It may not be the reason there is a problem. But looking for that growing frustration in players is the indication that there is something happening. Uh, and there is something that, that you know, may blow up. And, and, you know, there may be a table flip because this person is being pushed or is, you know, getting frustrated and angry mm -hmm. at another player or at a situation in the... That has uh, that has come around, uh, and that's usually more visible than the player who is doing something, you know, sneaky or manipulative or uh, right or otherwise. Yeah, and don't necessarily just blame the person who got upset, because nope, nope. <laughs> it it could be the fault of the other person doing that sneaky, underhanded sabotage, cheating. Who knows? Yeah. Right? You're finding you're finding you, you want to stop the game. You yeah, don't yeah. want to necessarily stop the player. Stop no, the game, take a break. If you have to talk to people separately, find out what really happened. Most of it, all it's, most of the time, all it is is tempers are flaring. Take five minutes, right? So here's something. This this comes from con RPGs and something called the open table. And it's something I got to admit, probably even I should adapt more to board gaming. And the open table is a safety tool. And what it is, is that anytime, if you're uncomfortable with the game, just get up and walk away. And no one's going to judge you for it. So it's not a, hey, man man, you're ruining the game, right? No, it's, hey, I need a break. I need to go to the washroom, walk away. Just walk away. And then come back 10 minutes later, come back to it. It's something I it should probably be promoted more at board games as well, because some games can be tense, right? There are, there are tense board games, and there are also games that are all about lying and deceiving each other. And sometimes you need a cool down period to get past the fact that Sean, my friend, is lying to me and realize, no, no, Sean playing whatever, I can't remember the names of the people in Coop or whatever, Sir, Sir Belvedere the Traitor is lying to me, right? And realizing that there's a disconnect there and part of it's part of the game and part of them isn't part of the game and to real not to, to deal with that bleed between one and the other. Absolutely, uh, especially with some of these hidden traitor games, it can be a real problem uh, for some people 
Uh, Mo's talked about it on numerous occasions where, you know, you're you're not comfortable with the lying and things, uh, but you want to play the game with your friends. Um, so maybe if you see yourself, if you catch yourself, uh, you know, getting frustrated or getting uh, getting emotional about things, you know, if you can, step out yourself. Uh, if you see someone else, maybe just politely mention, hey, do you want to, uh, you want to go take a walk? Go have a drink, go, you know, something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, extract yourself or the person you see it happening from happening to out of that situation and try and, and calm everything down. So when you do that, don't call that person out. Your best thing is not, Hey, Sean, do you need a break? No, Sean's going to go on the defensive and be like, no, I don't need a break. I'm good. Let's go. No, just yourself. Sit back, say, Hey, you know what, guys, I got to use the washroom. I'll be right back. And it causes the table to take a break. And you know what? That usually starts a snowball. Once you say, hey, I go to the washroom, you'll have three other people. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got to get some water. The one woman's like, I got to go for a smoke, whatever. But just try to distill it, take a break, come back. So going back to the question, we may have gotten this one already, but how do you handle people who want a game but aren't good at checking their zest for winning? I think we basically brought that up already. I think we kind of covered that. Um, one of the main things, again, set expectations before you start playing. Second, I try to group the competitive gamers together. And I will, if, if, if you organize local events, if you have enough people who are into this, you want to feed that. Like, it's a good thing. You A bunch of competitive gamers means host a tournament. It's going to go over very well, right? So what I'll do is if I have a bunch of casual events and I get a bunch of players saying, oh, I want to play. Oh, we want to take this more serious. Oh, man, I miss this. I'm like, you know what? It's time for a great Canadian board game blitz. Let's put a competition. Let's put some money on the line. Let's get the game store to donate a game and throw it a Catan tournament for our next event instead of this and give those competitive players something to fight for, right? Give them feed that, right? Like, it's not necessarily a bad thing it can go to a bad level but competition in itself is a human thing it's not a bad thing yeah very it's very much uh, a balance uh, you don't want to have the super social gamers and the competitive gamers at the same table when possible because that is the the key to getting that conflict uh between players started um because a competitive player is generally not going to enjoy playing mm -hmm. with someone who isn't taking it as seriously as they are um, whereas the social gamer may not care either way, you know, they're just there to have fun. Uh, they, and they might not be completely oblivious to the fact that this other person is fuming and steaming as they, you know, take their time and goof around and, you know, throw down joke cards instead of doing something else. Uh, you know, and, and catching that and, and heading it off at the pass is, uh, what everyone at the table and around the table needs to sort of to watch out for and again if if you can head it off in advance by not putting them at the same table and if things go bad while you're playing there is nothing wrong with saying i'm sorry i'm not having fun playing this right now i'm gonna stop if you're not having fun playing the other thing is just because someone shows up to your game night does not mean they have a right to play and that you must play with them um if you ever get a chance to google it on the internet look up the geek social fallacies uh that was eye-opening for me because a lot of us grew up um didn't have a great time in school. We were the outsiders. We were picked on. And we grew up with these screwed up ideas in our heads that because we were picked on and they were picked on, I have to include them in our group, even if they're problematic and even if they're jerks. And I'm trying to stay not explicit here. Even if they're doing nasty things, I have to put up with it because I don't want to be the bully that bullied me, right? Um You'd have to read through it. I don't want to get into the whole geek social fallacies, but there are people out there. You don't have to game with everyone. It's okay to say, hey, I don't like gaming with you. Uh, it's not easy to say. And probably you're going to have to do this, the passive aggressive thing because it's easier and just try not to play with that people. But I have people who show up to my events and will say, I refuse to game with this person. and I make sure not to sit them together. Even better is when both of them are adults and they know now that they don't like playing together. So they play with different groups. So if you're playing with someone, there's no problem with saying, hey, you're taking this far too seriously. I'm not having fun anymore. You can either tone it down or we can stop playing and you can go find someone else to play with. But there is no obligation to play with every person person who comes in the door. Now, as a host, I'm going to try. I'm going to give the person the benefit of the doubt. But once they've proven to be disruptive or unsafe, right? I'm just going to use that broad term of unsafe for someone who's violent, racist, misogynist, etc. Once they've proven to be unsafe, you give them, they, they, they don't get three strikes. They get one, right? You go up and say, hey, we don't do that here. And if you do it again, you're going to have to leave. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's tough. 
but if you want to run events there need you need to have the uh, the maturity to be able to set down rules and make sure that not only your game table is safe but everyone who is there feels safe and is safe uh in a safe space for their gaming uh in in every way um mm -hmm. no matter no matter uh, how they identify shape color creed etc So uh, Brian Kurtz has a good comment here. He said one thing he tried once was he appealed to the better nature, parenting pride of another adult by saying, hey, I really want to make sure my kids see me modeling good sportsmanship. And I think this might be getting a bit intense. Can we take a break? That's just a really good way to word it. Uh, it's, it's a good way to do it. There, there is, there's no obligation to finish a game you've started. This comes up multiple times. We've mentioned it many times on the show, especially teaching games. Don't Once everyone's got the rules, start over. Or Sean even talked about a game of Hogwarts Battle where they knew there was no chance they could win, so they called it. And his son was getting frustrated in that game. There's no obligation. It's, it's the whole lost time fallacy. You watch the first 20 minutes of the movie. It's a two-hour movie. You watch the whole thing, even though the first 20 minutes is terrible, because you're like, oh, I already sunk 20 minutes into this. It's, it's, not, it's a thing our brains do that is not accurate not correct there is nothing stopping you from stopping that game i was actually super proud of my son last night uh we jumped into a second game back to back of uh dc uh and we were about you know four or five hands in and he said you know what i think one game a night is enough for me can, no. we, do can we be done now and i said absolutely and we packed it away right then and no. it was great he, he knew that he wasn't uh he wasn't in a good place he wasn't uh, gonna enjoy the game and so we stopped it right then and there. So another one he has, do we have any rules, explicit or implicit, that set the tone for gaming at your house or your events? So every event I publish, every event thing says it is free, open, family-friendly gaming. I think that sets a tone. I also say no board gaming experience is required. There will be people on hand happy to teach you the rules. So those are the two things. Now, I don't specifically call out competition there. But as I said, when I first sit down to game with someone for the first time, I will mention that our events are open family friendly and that well, we play to win. No one really cares that much about winning. And I will specifically point out, this isn't a tournament. There's no prize to be won. And I use those words. This isn't a tournament. There's no prize to be won. To kind of tone down. So if someone's competitive, they, even if they're there to win, they're like, okay, I know I'm not going to win anything except pride for winning. And that tends to de-escalate it right from the start. Yeah, at home, I don't have any specific rules. Uh, again, it's just uh, more about setting that environment. You know, my kids know that they can stop the game if they don't want to. Um, they know Danny will step in and stop a game if things are uh, getting heated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they need to police themselves for that. And again, it's setting that that tone and environment more so than explicit rules mm -hmm. that uh, that that stop things or because uh, again, any rule you have, there's going to be exceptions and, you know, right and wrong. So it, it's best to, to set the set the overall tone uh, and uh, only if necessary, get down to the uh, the nitty gritty of individual rules. Now, the events I am involved in nowadays are all at local game stores. I haven't done an event that isn't at a game store for a long time. I got extremely busy for work and wasn't able to host my own events anymore. Now, I do help out one of the local game stores now with their events, but it's still their event, and I'm just there to help out. And none of them have any explicit rules. But one of the things, again, going back to role-playing, safety, safety rules, and the example cons like Breakout Con have set, I think if I did start running WG, GR events or whatever I'd call them now uh, at local events, I would probably come up with a set of rules as well as a harassment policy right from the start and having something in there that explicitly states we are all here to have fun. This is not a competition would probably be one of the bullet points. I don't know if that's exactly how I would word it, but I'm thinking codified rules is worth having because it sets ritual. And by setting ritual, you also set expectation. So while the fact that Sean and I may think that we have a bunch of implicit rules, there could be someone who comes off on the street that has a completely different view of what their expectations are and what their implied rules are for what their table presence is. No, absolutely. I, again, there, there are certain needs depending on what you want. At home, I think setting the tone and setting the environment for the game uh, is, is probably all you need. But yes, if you are going out there and you're running public games for... Um, 
a store especially, uh, mm -hmm. there is there is benefit in setting some sort of official rules, uh, even if they are a little more on the vague side. Uh, but again, setting that tone, because for one thing, the store may have liability. Yes. Um, and, you know, you don't want to uh, have enabled aggressors or negative situations to have evolved during an event uh, that, that could open up them to liability. I mean, luckily here in Canada, we're a little less uh, concerned about that. Mm. But uh, to any of our American listeners, there is a real concern for the legal liability of anyone running a gaming event. Uh, if there is um, aggression and negativeness and bullying going on at those events and it becomes a toxic environment, mm -hmm. you are opening yourself and that store up to liability. So again, setting that tone, and if you need to, through explicit uh, rules, may well be necessary at those public events. So just a, a, I don't know what to call it, sidebar. This is making it sound like competition is terrible, and I don't mean it that way. Being <laughs> overly competitive is terrible. Competitive, we're, we're humans. We're all competitive in our nature, and part of why we play board games is to see who wins, right? It's it's it sets. It, they're, they're, I don't want to get into lizard brain stuff, but it sets <laughs> you know rankings and stuff in society and and in your group, peer group, where you all stand by who wins a Catan. It all matters, right, in our heads. That's why we do this. It's part of what it sets off some neurons in the back of our head that. When we play board games, it's it's recreating, getting out and actually, you know, going to war and fighting and whatever, right? It's it's the safe way to interact with those, safe way to engage in those situations, right? You have your war over a board game over dice and your strategy. I think competition is fantastic. I'm just saying don't take it too far. I don't play my games willy-nilly. Again, I play to win and I don't care who wins. And that's what I expect of the people who I play with. I also don't want to play with someone who's just going to goof around and have fun. So just to kind of bring it back to that, that we're not sitting here trying to harp on people who are competitive. No, we are welcome to be competitive. Just don't take it too far. Yeah, it's all it's all about the excess. Uh you don't want you don't want the excesses. Uh competitive is great. Flipping the table because someone else did something you perceive as wrong. Uh, and that has prevented you from being victorious, that's not all right. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or actively sabotaging others because that will help you win. That's not all right. Um, it's... Yeah, I'm strongly against the sabotage. I don't know. Like I, It was one of those things I didn't realize people did until I saw it, and I was just like, wow, that just felt so wrong to me. So going on to, I think the last part of Brian's question here was sticking apart from sticking to strictly cooperative games, which yes, I, we didn't even bring that up, but man, Hey, how to, how to deal with the, that overly competitive person, put them with a bunch of other people and make them play a game together. We're all on the same side complete. I think I skipped over it cause I knew this question was coming because to me it was implied, but yes, cooperative games are a fantastic way to engage your your uh, competitive players, right? Put them on the same team as everyone else. Even competitive, even cooperative games with hidden traders, I think work great for this, especially if you can somehow rig it for that competitive player to be the trader. They seem to love that. Just something I've noticed. So Brian continues to ask, are there any tips for choosing games based on what you know about your gamers and your ability to handle competition? I think that's pretty simple. Uh, again, not talking about cooperative games, because yes, cooperative games are great, but competitive gamers want games where there's that aggression, right? Competitive gamers that want to fight are going to love the, how was it termed, knife fight in a foam booth that was Immortals, right? Like, that's the kind of thing. Get a bunch of competitive gamers playing that game, and it's going to be great. Like, uh, the Chopes would have a fantastic time playing Immortals. Um and if you have non-competitive people, you play non-competitive games. Like, there's a reason that Deanna does not like party games, because she is a competitive gamer and she wants to win. She wants a game where she can get a score and she can rank herself versus everywhere else. When you play a family game, that doesn't happen. It's an event. We're all here to have fun and socialize. That's something I know about her. I know she doesn't like those kind of games. It's also why she doesn't like co-ops. So you cater your games to the players you are playing with. Um, 
I, I, generally, I find heavier Euros tend to appeal to competitive gamers. Uh, the people who have memorized the opening moves to Puerto Rico, there's a reason that's Puerto Rico. No one has memorized the opening moves to Descent 2nd Edition because it's an Ameritrashy. Yeah, there's some Euro to it, but it's all about the dice and the theme. Uh, it's I, I, I can't give specific game recommendations, but... Um, even with dexterity games, right? Your competitive gamers are going to like your Jenga and they're going to like your hamster roll and they're not going to like your junk art as much because it's all feely and build stuff and sometimes you work together. One thing one thing you can do is if you are at a point where you need to put together those competitive and the non or lesser competitive, I don't want to say non-competitive because that's the mm -hmm. wrong word, but lesser competitive, more social gamers. Uh, one of the good ways is to get a game that uh, some of those Euro um, solitaire by each other, you know, group solitaire mm -hmm. games. Single player solitaire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you're, if or you're all playing your own game and someone's going to come out in the, uh, and someone's going to come out ahead, it matters less. Uh, it's again, even um, seven wonders is kind of great for that because mm -hmm. a competitive player is sitting there focusing on what everyone else is doing and, and, and digging in and, and getting tight. Whereas the social player is just sort of sitting there and playing whatever they want. And, Neither of them are affecting each other's game uh, mm -hmm. directly, uh, and they're both playing their own the same game, but their own version of that game. Um, and the competitive player can trounce everyone and be proud of their, you know, fifty score. And the other person can say, "Hey, look at that! I made three wonder, three stages of my wonder, and yay for me!" And it works. Um, so again, if you've got that that group of different. Uh, levels, mm -hmm. uh, games like that that allow you to sort of play in separate uh, lanes work well. Uh, just to jump back to when I was talking about cooperative games and she games, Deanna did make a very good point. One thing to watch for when putting your competitive gamers into cooperative games is the whole quarterbacking situation or the alpha gamer situation so yeah i don't tend to put the competitive gamer in a game of pandemic because pandemic is terrible for having one player try to dictate what everyone else is doing you're going to try to look for cooperative games see i was thinking more shadows of the camelot um uh dead of winter uh like i said more of the hidden traitor hidden role style Battlestar galactica i was more thinking those type of co-ops where there are still sides um I'm trying to think of good co-ops uh, that don't have a quarterback problem, and I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, the, thing at, uh, the thing at 13? Uh, 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 Outpost 13, yeah, that's a good hidden trader. But I'm trying to think of pure co-ops that where you have your own hand of cards and you do your own thing. Aeon's End uh, is a good example. Sentinels of the Multiverse. You played Sentinels of the Multiverse. There's no real good way for me to tell you what to do in that game, except, hey, try to buff me or, hey, don't, right? Everyone's got their own deck, their own cards. They're working on their own thing. You're going to try to pick co-op games where you're trying to do your other thing. The other thing, too, that I found cooperative gamers or, sorry, competitive gamers really like is puzzles. So puzzle-style games seem to appeal to them. People who are on that higher tend to enjoy the high complexity level. I, in a way, it's games that make them feel smart, right? That's it's pandering to base impulses, but you give them a game that makes them feel smart, they're going to enjoy it. Uh, so Ricochet Robots, that is a game people love or hate, and I found the people who love it are the highly competitive gamers in my group. The people who hate it are the people who are there just have fun because it's too much work. Now, my friend Eugene pointed out something. So Eugene's on the low competitive scale but he plays with a bunch of people on the high competitive scale actually on the high aggression scale to the fact that they wrote war rules for Catan because Catan was too boring and Eugene is getting frustrated going to their events and what he said I'm sick of showing up to play games that make it feel like I'm taking an exam I didn't study for Whereas his friend Neil is like, oh my God, I got to take another exam I didn't study for and I passed, right? So that's kind of the two scales of gamers right there. And they play in the same group together. And sometimes Neil's frustrated because they're playing games that are too fluffy. And sometimes Eugene's frustrated because he felt like he took an exam. So an example of catering your game group to this is this weekend Sean was down, which we're gonna get to fairly soon actually, I think we're both done this part of the topic. And we talked about who's going to be invited to play games with us. And I invited Eugene. And then I went to a social event that had Eugene and Neil both there. And Deanna mentioned, like, do you want to invite Neil? And I'm like, yes, I want to invite Neil. And then I started thinking about it. And I'm like, 
Sean is fairly new into modern war wargaming. Like we've been friends for years, but there was a big break in between, and we didn't. He he missed all the the Catans and Carcassons of the world, and missed that evolution of gaming. And I kind of, when the first time he came down, I kind of threw him into the deep end with some heavier games, and it didn't go over that well, which is my fault, not his. Like uh, Wasteland Express Delivery Service for your first modern war game, or modern board game, is a bit much. There's just way too many little things going on in that game. And here I'm thinking of inviting Neil, and Neil's like, I want to play. Feudum and I want to play Tricurion and why aren't we playing Arkwright and then I'm going to bust, bust out Sentinels in the Multiverse. He's going to be, what's this silly fluffy superhero game, right? So I didn't invite Neil, I invited Huge and we played games like Zaya, which probably would have drove Neil nuts. Uh, I'll, I'll try to summarize. Now, again, I have no show notes, so I'm just trying to remember things we mentioned. Uh, big ones, set expectations, let people know what's going on, uh, try to group competitive gamers with competitive gamers, uh, find a common ground, read people, try to find out what um, what type of games they enjoy. And from that, you can be able to determine how competitive they are. Uh, then for choosing games, you want games that are head to head, aggressive and puzzly for competitive gamers. And you want light, fluffy family style games. Right. So you got your your two ends of the spectrum there. I don't know, Sean, do you, anything we missed in there? No, I think that that pretty much it. Uh, again, the only oh. thing, other thing would be start, start early, yes. set the tone at home, and make sure that uh, you're you're uh, bringing up the best gamers you can. That's it. Yeah, I did forget that. That's raise your kids right. <laughs> All right, so that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming game game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other topics answered in blog form, although this one won't be there just yet because we talked about it before it went live on the yeah. blog for a change. Well, you'll still see questions like this and topics like this answered in blog form. They're still there. You just won't find this one. Yeah. If you do have a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, I want to take a short break here just to say I really enjoyed this question from Brian. I like this type of question. This is the kind of thing I would love to see more of. Like, while I enjoy answering questions, looking for, like, what are five games I can bring to Grandma's house, it's nice to get a bigger, heavier topic like this. And what I liked about this question is it had background behind it. Uh, there was something we could really dig into. Plus, Brian mentioned that these were specific problems he'd run into, and I like getting that bit of insight into where the question comes from. Like, Brian could have just said, hey, talk about competition in games. I liked the long-term question, like that format. So my dream for the show when we first started it was to be a Dear Abby for gamers. And if you've ever read Dear Abby, if you're old enough to know exactly what I'm talking about, they're usually long. Hey, I was at the beach on the weekend, and this situation happened, and this, and it ends with a question. I would love to see more of that in our questions instead of just, hey, what are... Uh, I can't think of what are your favorite what? three player games underwater? Yes, exactly. Uh, Hive would be no, no, that's two player. Shoot, I don't know. Playing underwater, that doesn't leave very many games, but anyway, right? Like, uh, just a little more depth to it. I love having such a deep question. So, thank you very much, Brian, for that. And for the rest of you out here, I would love to see more questions like that. Uh, so we were <laughs> asking about your comp uh, levels of competition and how competitive you are in games. Uh, I know And She Games is uh. Loving the competition and looking forward to taking exams she hasn't studied for. Yeah, well, I say it's the reward, right? If you, if you were able to pass that exam, how good does that feel, right? That that's that's the lizard brain part of this whole thing. I know I lost the whole other chat. I, I saw Tech had commented about how he's. He plays to win, but he's there for the social aspect. He's there to play the game. It's all about playing the game, being with other people. Winning doesn't matter in the least, but he does play to win. So we're kind of on the same page there. Uh, I can't scroll back to see anyone else's chat comments uh, here. Poncho tries to lot. sneak some cash in Monopoly. Uh. <laughs> I did see someone ask if there was a cheaters version of Monopoly. Yes, there is Monopoly Cheaters Edition. I don't know what that means. I don't plan on picking that up whatsoever. Uh, uh, Brian notes he's more of a facilitator than a competitor. Yeah, so that's a DM role, right? So Brian comes, I think, from what I know of Brian, more from an RPG route. And I have a hard time playing competitive dungeon crawl style games. 
where there's like a DM and the players. So Mansions of Madness, Descent, Imperial Assault, and not being an advocate of the players. I am, I'm terrible at that. I'm like probably the worst uh, keeper in, uh, what's it called, in Mansions of Madness ever because I want the players to win. And I'm, when I'm, I forget that, oh, wait, this is a board game. I'm supposed to try to win. Uh, I know just before the uh, freeze, Poncho was talking about how uh, he's had those table flipping moments happen to him uh, back in the uh, 80s with Axis and Allies. Ooh. And boy, is that a mess to have a table oh, flip that's on. that's a lot of little plastic bits. There's yeah. a lot of little plastic bits. So again, I thank all of you who are in the lobby here tonight for interacting. It has been great to see the text scroll by as we've been discussing this topic. So we are done with the main topic. We are going to move on to the rest of the show. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. So last week, I noted I was a guest on the Onboard Games podcast, a show you should all really check out. If you dig this, you'll dig them. Now, Monday, I was all ready to share out the link to everyone, but it ends up the show I'm on is delayed one week. I knew this might happen. So you should be able to hear me on the episode that goes live next Monday or last Monday, if you're listening to the podcast, on April the 15th. Uh, it should be episode 345. You can find On the Board Games and other great podcasts like On RPGs, the Games in School and Libraries podcast, and Escape Room Divas at inversegenius.com. That's On Board Games, not On the on, Board Games. Yes, yeah, sorry. On Board Games. Good show. Really good show. So it's time for my RPG a month review for March. Every month, I'm trying to read and review at least one RPG that I've owned way too long. Something that's gathered dust on my shelf or on my hard drive. So I got to admit, I've been sticking to physical books so far. Now, that's the point of RPG a month. Get some use out of those books you bought but haven't used. From a one-pager PDF to a hefty tome of dead trees, they add up in all our libraries. <laughs> <laughs> they do. I have a ridiculous number of RPGs if I go on RPG Geek. So in March, I read the Demon Lords, or no Demon, no the. I read Demon Lords Companion, which was the first supplement released for Shadows of the Demon Lord. Now, Shadows of the Demon Lord core rulebook is what I read for RPG a month last month in February. So this just made sense to follow up with this book. Plus, some people on Twitter actually recommended I read this one. Uh, this is a smaller, soft cover book clocking in at only 50 pages. Uh, these 50 pages are split into five chapters, each of which adds something to what's already in the core rulebook. It's not a bunch of brand new stuff. So you find new ancestries, which are halflings and fawns. Eight new expert pass, 12 new master pass, uh, some new equipment rules, which are for alchemy, and some higher tech items, which is some of the stuff I like in Shadows of the Demon Lord, because it's set a tech level above most fantasy settings. Like you have clockworks and steam power and uh, handguns exist in the setting. Uh, to tie that in as well, there are vehicle rules for the first time. So this is the one big new thing that's in there that's not in the core rule book, are rules for vehicles, which actually include rules for airships and dirigibles. I'm generally on board with this. I really like the idea of fawns as PCs. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's a, n a nice thing you don't often see outside of, you know, farther extreme, you know, ex extra material for games. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm always hesitant when I hear about airships in my fantasy games. Uh, you need a strong GM and or system uh, when the party gets into that sort of technology. I know uh, I've, I've seen a lot of D&D uh, &D games using uh, steamships and such go really sideways. Uh, so I'd be interested to see how the game as a whole handles the, this slightly more advanced technological level uh, to avoid that. 
Yeah, it's, uh, having not actually played the game, I couldn't tell you how it works in play. But Schwab definitely tried to mash all the things in. And having Steampunk in there, I got to admit, even to me, feels a little odd. Because you got Dark Horror Fantasy, obviously inspired by Warhammer, and they threw in Clockwork Character Class. There's a Clockwork Character Class that literally winds down, and you have to determine where your secret uh, key is so one of the other player characters can uh, wind you back up if you stop, which is neat, but it just the, with Warhammer seems a little different. But yep. he's just taking it to that next level, throwing the airships in. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing that's in the book are six new types of magic. And a neat thing is one of those types, uh, two of the different spell classes of those six, or two of them are psionic, which I thought was cool because what they did is they treated psionics the same as magic, which I thought was rather elegant and better than having a full subsystem just for psionics. It really does make sense. Psionics are, gen are generally speaking, just a spell mm -hmm. with a mental rather than a physical object or somatic, somatic component. Yeah, just I totally sense. agree. It was, a, it was a really good way to do it instead of having to buy the complete book of psionics, which every D&D &D character made since that book comes out now has a 1% chance to have psionic powers, which have a completely different system that's non and so on. Uh, this book, uh, Demon Zord Companion, finishes off with some game master tools, which include some new monsters. Now, overall, I was pretty happy with this book. Now, part of me, especially when I first started reading it, kept making me think that why isn't this just in the core rule book? Like, I just felt like more of the same. Like, well, you have four races in the rule book. Or sorry, they call them ancestries. Four ancestries in the core book. Why have these two be in a separate book? Why didn't you just put them in? Uh but then I thought about it more logically. Actually, more people called me out on it on the internet and was like, what are you talking about? Because obviously you just can't keep adding stuff to the core rule book because it ends up being way too big and intimidating. And while the price would start going crazy and where do you draw the line? Where do you say, hey, here's the end of the core rule book. Eventually you can end up with, you know, well, look at the Pathfinder core rule book, for an example, of a book that tried to fit everything in one. That's an intimidating large book. Yeah, it's a tough line, uh, and especially with major publications, uh, it's usually your spec which will set a limit on your page count. Um, you'll know before you're done, before you're writing uh, how big your book is allowed to be, uh, and you won't get to increase that without mm -hmm. significant cost implement implement ugh, implications <laughs> that sort of you know spiderweb out uh, from just. The fact that the book is longer into all other th things, marketing, shelf space, and, and all mm -hmm. sorts of things you need to, to think about um, beyond, you know, throwing something up on drive through RPG where the page length count might not matter. Uh, sometimes you just have to put things in a later pile or your book's just not going to get printed. Yeah, this one also was tied into Kickstarter somehow. So some of this may have been stretch goals and so on. So the... the it was one of those, the core rule book was done. And then this was additional content that probably came up because of that. I, I got the game long after the Kickstarter was done by years. Now you can find that uh, review at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews and look for race for the galaxy. No, That's... <laughs> I <laughs> tried. You, you, hit, you hit it just too soon. You can find that review on tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews and no, click on RPG a month. Um, no, there's no RPG a month. There just is no RPG on. a month? No, just click on reviews. It'll just be there. click on reviews then. It'll yeah. be there. <laughs> just click on reviews. Yeah, I, I got to read our show notes with a little more. Apparently, yeah. So both of, us, both of us need to actually stop just copying and pasting from the previous, from the previous uh, one. Yeah. So uh, look just, for Demon Lord's Companion under reviews on tabletopbellhop.com. Yeah, I'm not sure how we'll cut that out for the podcast. But yeah, I tried to, I noticed it and I'm like, oop. Oh, it's it's where I forget that I make individual references to the ga games because yep. the the first part's good. Yep. Here, and I try we just to, edit have to stop so. right there. <laughs> there we go. We did too good at the first half of the show. Now it's just going to all fall apart. <laughs> all right. Up next, we have our weekly Gloomhaven update. Our last session did not go well. Uh, did not go well at all. Town stuff went fine. The road encounter was no big thing. Actually, I don't even remember what happened. There was no drama. But then we got to the dungeon and things started off bad and just kept getting worse. Uh, we're playing scenario 20, Necromancer Sanctum. Finally catching up with the big baddie from the start of the campaign, Jexira. As soon as we read the mission goal, we knew it was going to be a boss fight. And... I'm pretty sure we all expected it wouldn't be easy, but wow, none of us expected it to be nearly as hard as it was. 
Apparently, I'm a good luck charm now, and uh, the police <laughs> frown on Twitch interactions while doing highway driving, so I wasn't available to uh, pass on my good luck to the yes. uh, to the team. Yeah, because we, we were talking about it, and we're like, wait a minute, when we were losing all those missions, we weren't streaming, and Sean wasn't there. And it's once we started streaming, we started winning more often when Sean was in the chat, and Sean wasn't in the chat that night. So we kind of blamed this on, on Sean. So some of it was bad luck, some of it was Sean wasn't there. Um, the fact the undead kept healing themselves, and the cultists just kept summoning more undead, was totally based on what cards got drawn from the monster deck. Uh, so that was a random thing that the next time we play could be completely different. I know we've had other games where the bad guys just sat there and shielded themselves after we hit them. So that, there's definitely a random factor to Gloomhaven and that was part of this. But I also felt like we just weren't playing our best. Uh, we made some that bad decisions that I think were based on overconfidence. The fact that we've been winning the last few battles, uh, it's been a while since we got smacked down. So I think this might've been a good lesson for us. Now, on a positive note, we did manage to snag some treasure that should make things way easier next time in two ways. Now, for one, my character has a kick-ass axe that should make those undead a bit easier to handle. And second, we now know there's a whole part of the dungeon we can skip and don't need to go to because we already looted the axe. And the fact that axe gives you a bonus versus undead almost makes me wonder if this scenario was designed to fail it the first time because it's basically an item that would have been great to have for this mission, but when you find it, you can't use it. And I'd like to say thank you again, Brian, for uh, stopping by, and I was glad you could be here to uh, hear us answer your question. Enjoy your night. Yeah, good night, Brian. Thanks again for the question and for backing the show. Now, you can find out uh, by tuning in this Friday, if that ax will be enough to bring them in through it the second time. Yeah. Again, that's Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Or if you miss it, the following Thursday, it will go live on YouTube uh, for everyone at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? So every week we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. So this past weekend we had a small belated birthday party for Sean at my place. For most of it, it was just Deanna, Sean, and I, but our mutual friend Eugene joined us for part of Saturday. During that time, we got in quite a few games. This wasn't the sort of uh, major event we've had in the past with streaming and whatnot, but just a great chance to get in some face-to-face -face gaming with uh, adults and longtime friends. So the first game we played, this was, uh, was this Friday night after Gloomhaven or did we play Saturday morning? I can't even remember now. No, I think we uh, we called in a night on Friday and uh, okay. jumped in on Saturday. We did jump in on Saturday. So Saturday morning. So Sean showed up partway during, uh, right at the end of the Gloomhaven game and watched me get beat down. I think at every that point, everyone else was uh, exhausted except my character. Uh, so the first game I decided to show Sean was Clank, a deck building adventure. Now this is, up until this past weekend, I would say my favorite deck builder. It had surpassed something else, but I tested that theory and found that I decided I liked the other one better. One of my favorite deck builders that I decided Sean needed to play because he's been huge into card games lately with playing Harry Potter and playing uh, the DC deck building game. So I wanted to show off this one. Plus, I swear back in the day, Sean, in the 80s, Sean had played Dungeon Quest with me. And this game really reminds me of a modern Dungeon Quest. So this is one of those games that comes up in any broad discussion of deck building games. Uh, and I have to say, I get why. Uh, the theme is really well integrated into the game. The very part, various parts of it work well together. And the, with the variety of paths and options, both on the board and in your deck, the replayability of this game is just huge. Uh, you're not going to play the same game uh, too many times in a row, even if you've got the exact same people trying to mm -hmm. do the same thing. Um, it just, it randomizes enough that you get that fresh game. What I really love about Clank is how different it feels depending on who you play it with and how those people play. So this last game, I think was the quickest game of Clank I'd ever played because we taught the game to Sean and Sean kind of rushed in grabbed a couple treasures and ran. 
and was like out early and i'm like wow i did barely got to build my deck here like usually i do a whole strategy where i try to focus on gems and jewelry and i couldn't even do that because i didn't get enough picks to pick stuff and i dig that about clank because there's other times i played and it's like a three hour slog because someone's trying to maximize and get every little thing and must explore every question mark before leaving the dungeon so it's something that, that lends itself to the the variability of the game is something i definitely enjoy yeah, no, that's uh, that's absolutely one I would uh, happily play again, given the opportunity. So up next, I grabbed the classic game. This one goes way back to 2003. No, I think it might be older than that. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, it's an old Spiel de Jar winner, and that is Alhambra. Now, this one was self-serving for me grabbing this. So besides the fact it's a good game. So... I do the throwback Thursday posts every, once or twice a month where I resurrect one of my old reviews. And I go on my old WGR forum and WGR blog and I look through the reviews and I've been doing them basically in order, right? Uh, and the last one I did was Race for the Galaxy. And so I went to do one. And I'm like, the next one I was supposed to do was Alhambra, which, um, yeah, it did come out in 2003. I think that's what I said. So I think I got that right. I don't know why that stuck in my head. Um, but the problem is I have not played Alhambra since 2013. So that shows how little it actually gets played at my house. But in my head, I'm like, no, it's a good game. Like it just hasn't come out for whatever reason. Just I've always wanted to play something else. So I wanted to play it again. So you're probably going to see a throwback Thursday review coming out for Alhambra because I got to say it's as good as I remember. This is a fantastic game with some unique mechanics. Like for a game that came out in 2003, I've still not seen another game that does the same thing with the money where you can take up the five or the whole if you buy it the exact amount, you get to go again. So it's cool to see that those still feel fresh, even though the game's ancient at this point, 16 years old. Yeah, no, I mean, this is a uh, great auction, Tableau Builder. And it's just solid mechanics all around. Uh, it's really well implemented. You can tell why this won the Spiel des Um, What I'm shocked at is that there aren't more re-implementations mm -hmm. of it. Uh, there's a couple. I know, like, there's a Manhattan, and I think there's something New else. New York. Yeah. But it's uh, Granada and New York are the two re-implemented. Yeah. But, you know, it's just the mechanic is so solid and realistically it doesn't matter what's on the cards. No. I mean, it could be, it could be a desert city or a metropolis or, you know, the, a starship or something mm -hmm. there. I I'm really shocked that this hasn't been more re-implemented than it has because it's a really good yep. game. Uh, and it doesn't matter that it's, you know, what, what your theme is essentially. I wonder if it just Queen Games didn't want to license it out. Cause I think for a long time, it, it might still be their number one game. It's their terraforming Mars, right? Like right. it's the game that makes them the most money. I wonder yeah. if that might be why. Possibly. But although you'd think you could make enough money off licensing of it. that Yeah, yeah I don't know. But it's true. <laughs> I, there's a New York one, Granada, I've heard of. Yeah, Granada. Yeah. The only two listed uh, on the sidebar in uh, BGG are those are Granada and New York. So up next was a bit of a flop in a way. Um, so Sean digs DC deck building. Um, I don't own Marvel Legendary, so I would have showed him Marvel Legendary so you can compare the two, but I'm not a huge fan of Marvel Legendary. And I wanted to show off my favorite superhero game, which is Sentinels of the Multiverse. Now, this is not a deck building game. This is a card based game, but there's no deck building involved. Every character, every player gets their own deck. And it's really cool the way it simulates a superhero battle because you just pick each character picks a hero you decide what villain to fight and then you decide where you're fighting them and you pick different decks so you have each player's deck you have the villain's deck and the environment deck the villain does something every turn all the players get to do something then the environment happens and generally it's a really neat game but it's a little fiddly because there's a lot of little modifiers and little someone's immune to this this turn then they're immune to that next turn and you got plus one to this and minus to that it's a little fiddly but i still usually really enjoy it and i think this was a bad showing of this game because i decided to pull out something from my pile of shame which is the deck called The Scholar, which I thought was based on Gary Gygax, but I'm not positive. It's got kind of a Gygaxian look. It could also be based on the dude from, um, I can't remember the name of the movie now. Uh, the Dude Abides, whatever movie that's from. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I don't know. But the whole deck was literally healing. Like the entire deck was, my power was heal once a turn. My next power was draw two cards and heal. And then my next one was every time you heal, heal extra. And there were like three cards in the deck that actually let me do damage. Well, the problem was 
Sean was playing Legacy, which is like the super hitman of the Sentinels of the Multiverse game, who's also a tank. And then we had D playing Ra, who is an awesome damage dealer, but who only does one type of damage. And we fought against a villain that once they were hit by a type of damage, never took that type of damage again. And two tanks and only one fight, it just, it was a bad combo. Yeah, you know what? I <laughs> D, D is wondering in chat if I would ever play it again. And the answer is absolutely. Uh, right. I think as a superhero game, it's fantastic. What we didn't, what we didn't know, what we didn't understand is what the characters were. I, I had yeah. never played it, so I, I had no idea what any character was. I thought, hey, look, that looks like a fun character to play. I'll play him because I like the graphic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what D, how D chose hers, and you, you picked yours because we were doing the pile of shame. Mm -hmm. um, now that I've played it, I would look at our character choices and try mm -hmm. and build a party to go up against the villain, whoever it was. I, I don't even know if I necessarily pick a, you know, a party based on the villain, but I would pick a party that worked together mm -hmm. rather than the disaster of a combination of players that we ended up choosing. Um, but as a superhero game, it was really enjoyable. It really was All fun. Right. And I can completely see how, if the proper team was assembled, that it would be a fantastic superhero theme. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. it. It didn't seem like you enjoyed it as much at the time. So I was a little worried that I'm like, oh, I failed that storing <laughs> off Sentinels of the Multiverse because it can be really good. Though I have a feeling that's probably a parent problem inherent in the game that certain combos are going to work better. So it's it's definitely not a perfect game. I'm sure if you Google it, you can find all kinds of combos. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's building any team, any, uh, you know, in any video game, even if you're going to build a party, you've got to build mm -hmm. the right party. You can't have five priests and you know be as successful all right uh the next one we grabbed my friend eugene had shown up at this point and as i mentioned before you just into big high adventure games with uh lots of conflict so i brought out zaya legends of a drift system i think i've talked about this one enough on the podcast i dig it I love the expansion. You've got to play with the expansion. The cell sword's kind of dumb. Other than that, I've covered it on previous episodes. You can listen to me talk about Zaya whenever you want. What I want to know is how much how Sean felt about this one. You no, know, this was a great time. Uh, and the randomness of the map was absolutely like a fourth player in the game. <laughs> um, and the NPCs, while not super active, uh, really made for some amusing mm. interactions and fun moments in the game. Uh, my NPC, the only person that ever did any damage or attack to was me. Yep. <laughs> um, at one point, the uh, the mercenary character just ended up giving people the stuff. The scoundrel ended up just being generous and giving people stuff. And that was kind of the only thing they did the entire game was be yes. a nice a nice scoundrel. Um, and uh, you were the only one who ever interacted with the merchant uh, by blowing yep. them up. Um, you know, it was it was just a, a fun sort of thing. I hadn't been aware that the deck uh, that the um, the map built itself so slowly. I thought there was more revealed at uh, at opening. Oh, okay. Um, I was I wasn't. I, I thought you sort of you, you laid out the map and then started playing. I wasn't realized that you you laid out a piece of map mm -hmm. and then started playing. Uh, and that was an, that was a, a, an interesting and, and enjoyable uh, way to go. So really, it, it's under, it's easy to understand now that I've played it, why this has got the incredible buzz it does since Embers mm -hmm. came out. Um, I know a lot of people thought it was kind of broken before Embers, but now it's uh, it's well worth a pickup. The nice thing about this game, too, is the tone was sent really early, which I think was good for Eugene's sake. The first time Eugene jumped to a new sector, he jumped into a debris field and blew up. And then the first time I tried to grab an exploration token, I blew up. So that was turn one and two of the game. Then Sean get the go. And I got to admit, I could see it in Eugene's eyes at first. He seemed a little taken aback, but then he just rolled with it. By setting that expectation early, it was like, oh, I'm getting covered in ice again. OK. Yeah. And I got to say, we had the worst sector of space ever. Like it was all debris fields, asteroids, comets, and ice fields. Like by the end of the game, we only had one lawful planet on the entire board. It was nuts. The pathfinding uh, involved in getting anywhere was painful because you just had to thread your way through debris fields and asteroids every step of the way just to get, uh, unless you unless you happen to be able to get near the uh, portals. So I took a break at this point, and then you got in a game of DC with Eugene. I did. Uh, yes, I am an addict. Uh, so I brought it down with me. Um, and while I was down there, we actually picked up another expansion while we were out at a game store. 
Uh, but we didn't play that one. I wanted to make sure uh, my kids got into that first. So I just played the stock game with Huge, uh, and I think he enjoyed it. Uh, I think there were a couple of things I probably could have taught a little better, and I got to think about um, how I introduced him to it. Um, there were a couple of things he missed early on, uh, missed in the in the first. But we again, it was all stuff we caught early on and and didn't affect the game. Um, so uh, he seemed to enjoy it and uh, would play it again. I think he's it's again it's it's one of those games where it's not you, you can be competitive, but mm -hmm. it's really easy to also just be kind of relaxed and just have a fun chatty game while you're playing and count up your points at the end, see who who wins. Yeah, I'm actually sad we didn't fit in a game at some point the whole weekend. I never did get to play DC. I played it a long time ago once. All right, up next. Now, this is the actual flop. Sentinels it ends up went over better than it should have. This did not go over well, and that's mostly my fault. So a lot of that is due to mixed exp or mismatched expectations. I guess I'll word it that way. So the game is Immortals. This is a big box game from Queen that I've been considering buying for a long time. Now, I am a huge fan of Dirk Hens Wallenstein, which was I played the original German in German with English translations taped onto the cards. Loved the game so much, I went out and bought the English version, which was released as Shogun, which changed the game to a samurai theme. Loved that so much that when Queen Games put out an English version of Wallenstein, I bought that too, which the games are almost identical except different maps. So I love this game. It was my number one for a long time, and it used to be the game I forced everyone to play on my birthday because I love the game so much, and I play a full six-player game. So when I heard Dirk Hen put out a new game called Immortals, where it uses the cube tower and it's all your armies fighting but when your armies die on one side of the board they go to the other side of the board i was sold instantly i'm like that sounds awesome then the reviews came out and it was really bad and then for some reason the game was available for like 80 percent off instantly online and i'm like whoa why is this game so cheap so then i went to origins and i actually asked them to give me a demo of the game and they refused to do it because they were trying to promote whatever their new hotness was but describe the game to me and the way it was sold to me was it's wallenstein and shogun dumbed down for the ameritrash crowds and it's a simpler game much more easy to understand, less programming, and more in-your-face combat, so there's more fights. And I'm like, huh, okay, that sounds less cool now. And the guy was seemed surprised. Like, I think he was trying to sell it to me, going, hey, it'll be awesome. You're, you're like, fighting really close, and it's easier, and it's simpler. And I'm like, eh. Eventually, it got cheap enough. I bought a copy. It dropped under 20 bucks for, like, an $80 game. And I'm like, eh, I'll try it out. So Eugene is a huge Wallenstein fan. Deanna, as far as I know, likes Wallenstein Shogun well enough. She's played it with me enough times. She knows the rules. And normally I wouldn't put Wallenstein or Shogun in front of Sean because he doesn't have the experience to really know it. And even if I did, we'd be playing some kind of simple game so I could kind of teach him the thing. But I was sold Immortals as this simple, easy Ameritrash version. And man, it was not like it wasn't even close. It for one, it's way closer to Wallenstein Shogun than I thought. Yeah, there's only two types of buildings instead of three. And no, the turn orders aren't in the exact it, turn orders aren't randomized and you don't auction for turn like for for player order but all the rest is still there the cube tower is there the fighting with the the farmers is still there they're called uh, i forget now the inhabitants they're called the inhabitants the inhabitants are still there the green cubes and all the confusion on whose side the green cubes are on is all there and like eugene put it well he's like no this isn't like wallenstein it's like trying to play two games of wallenstein at once because you have two boards going on so yeah that flopped badly and and mainly because the expectation i had of the game did not match what was in the box yeah this was uh problematic um we played extreme which oh, was yeah. one concern but uh Going in, I was concerned, having never played Wallenstein, Wallenstein um, but then watching everyone else who had played Wallenstein still struggle, I felt uh -huh. better. Um, but to me, I find the game just has problems beyond the extreme problems we introduced, um, that I, I would probably turn this one down if offered again. Uh, and there's not much. I mean, I, I would play, uh, you know... Even Wasteland Express, I would happily sit down yeah. again and, and, and try. Um, Immortals, uh, no, no, I'll find another table, thanks. It yeah. just uh, didn't work for me. See, now, thankfully, I realized that I it was my expectations that ruined it for me. So both Deanna, Deanna agreed, she said uh, the same thing, that I want to try it again. 
knowing the rules, not messing up what we messed up, realizing the really odd rule about stealing cards even when you win any battle, knowing that ahead of time and being able to explain that, I do want to give it another try. Now, I do at some point still want to try to sell you on Shogun or Wallenstein because it, it's similar, but they're good, and this so far wasn't. So, so I do want to try to get you there at some point to try the original to see what this at least was based on or trying to do. Yeah, no, I, I'm definitely, I'm definitely down to give Wallenstein a shot, but uh, or Wallenstein a shot. But this again, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not. You know, I, I think I'd have to really like, really, really Wallenstein like Wallenstein, and then be like, yeah, okay, be now like, I'll okay, try. now, now let's give this Immortals thing a try again. Um, but uh, as of right now. You know, even though I I know what we messed up, I know what we mm. did wrong, uh, and and I know, but there are aspects of it that I know what they are now. We figured out what, that we were actually it. doing that right, uh, and I think it's dumb. So yeah. <laughs> it's just it is what it is. Yeah, I also the next time I play, I'm going to look up and see if there's an FAQ and make sure we were doing that right. But yeah, Immortals was the one flop that didn't go over well. Partly my fault. Uh, I did read the rules the day before, so it's not like I, I didn't have a lot of time because I had just gotten the game the day before that. So I got the game at the wedding and then I read the rules on Saturday and or whatever. No, I had it longer, but whatever. I read the rules the day before, so I didn't realize it was going to be a problem. Uh, then moving on to Sunday. Uh, this was back to my quest of getting Sean to play older games that are really good that he probably missed. Uh, and that was Lords of Waterdeep which I still swear is one of the most pure and excellent worker placement games. Uh, I suggested over Kalis, if you want to teach people how worker placement games work, bring out Wards of Waterdeep over Kalis any day, even though I love Kalis. Um, the D&D theme makes it even better, in my opinion. Sean being a D&D fan, me being a D&D fan, being able to tie that in together, plus a little bit of build, engine building and a little bit of set collection tossed in there. Just a really good game that I do get tired of because it's so popular, but that's because it's so good that we play it a lot. See, I thought this game was fantastic. Yeah. I don't know why it's d and <laughs> I just, yeah. I guess, you, to me, like, if you strip out all of the flavor text and graphics, it's still a fantastic mm -hmm. game. And in playing it, you don't need any of the play flavor text and, and, gra and you know, D and D graphics. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, I know why it's Lords of water deep and I know I'm sure they sold a ton of extra to be Lords of water deep, but it didn't need to be because it was just a really good worker placement game. And if it had been cubes on a randomized map of Europe, I think I would have enjoyed it just as much because it was really well done. It's a really well built mechanical game. I don't, I look at it the other way that it's awesome. They finally put out a good D and D board game. Cause that was one of the first that it, cause most of the time the D and D and most licensed games aren't good games. And it was awesome to see D and D get a really good Euro game. Cause D and D didn't have anything like that before then. That's fair. So now the last one, I wanted to show Sean was what is my favorite deck building game now confirmed because I was starting to think it was Clank, but having played Core Worlds again last weekend, I still love Core Worlds. So despite the fact I play everything, I'm polygamous and I'm often talking about lighter one hour games. I'm also a real big fan of two to three hour, four hour heavy games. I find them more rewarding than quicker one hour games. I don't get to play longer games much because I'm usually playing at game stores and Core Worlds is the heavy deck builder there really isn't another one out there this is a game it is an engine builder 100 percent where you start off with almost nothing and slowly progress to be able to conquer worlds by the end of the game very cool game i uh, i strongly recommend using the galactic orders because that really helps uh bring the theme in in a way and really forces you to uh, drive your deck construction so that it's, you're not just buying random cards or the card that costs the most or the card that does the most damage because being able to bring those factions in can really change your strategy. Uh, playing Core Worlds again was great. I loved playing it again. It made me want to bring it out again this weekend. Yeah, no, I made some some dumb choices early on. And uh, my only concern with it, again, I enjoyed the game. I will absolutely sit down and play with that again. Uh, my only concern is whether or not uh, it's got, I made mistakes where that were unrecoverable or if I just mm. continued to make mistakes all the way along. Uh, that's what I'm, I'm not as sure about. Um, the other thing is, I don't know if I re really find this as replayable as clank. I don't know. Maybe I, it seems like there's more variability in clank, uh, to, to 
play a different game all the time. Whereas this, I think it, it felt like to me that uh, after a while, you'd, you'd just be playing the same same game over and again. I mean, once you've got, you know, sure, you've got all six factions, but once you've gone through all six factions, uh, you, you've sort of got that. So I don't know. And I, again, it's, I've only played yeah. once, so it's hard to say. And I would absolutely play down, sit down and play it a, a number of times again. But I, I do uh, have a concern as to whether or not in the long term, uh, if I played it as much as, as addictively as I did with, say, <laughs> DC, uh, whether or not it would hold up as well for as long. So I, I haven't found that problem with the number of times I played it. I couldn't tell you my exact number right now without looking it up, but it's at least 10 times, if not 15. And I've never found it feels the same because one of the things is we only went through about 25% of each of those sector decks. So there's definitely different strategies you can go with. Um, and it's going to be variable based on what cards come out, but that's the same as any deck builder. I don't think it's any less replayable than say an Ascension. Now as for Clank, Clank's got that, Clank's got that added thing of the way people play is going to change the game. The, the fact that someone can uh, dine and dash and someone could try to build up. You're not going to get that in any other deck builder because the whole board element is very different. But I haven't had that problem, but I could see possibly people getting sick of it. The fact it's not up there, I'm sure Clank's way higher on board game geek than core worlds. But like I said, it's, it's, it's the fact there's more strategy involved. There's the building your tableau. There's a fact, the fact you can hold on to one card. I'd love that rule. That should be in more deck builders yeah. where I can almost plan ahead for my next turn. So let's take a minute to look at the less. Wow. Let me try that again. I'm grab some water. That's almost done. Oh, wow. Clank, just, just for reference, Clank is at 59. Yeah. While Core Worlds is at 591. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. No, I still, I had more fun playing Core Worlds than I did Clank this past weekend. So they're still both up there. They're yep. both really good. Oh, no, out absolutely. of all the it's games it. I own, they're both way up there. Yeah, no, I, at, at this point, I, I absolutely would not turn down a, a game of either one of them. So no the only problem with Core Worlds is it's long. Like with three players, I think we played two and a half hours. Something like with that. With three yeah. players. Like you throw five players or six in that, and you're looking at three, four, five hours. So taking a moment to look at the last Shane Moore game, pile of shame count uh for those of you paying attention you'll notice the number's a little lower this week that's because i totally forgot last week that we were mashing two uh tabletop gaming weeklies together so i we hadn't reduced for fields and flocks and cypress legacy yet but now for this week scholar that scholar expansion that i somewhat complained about for sentinels of the multiverse kind of weird and funky it's all about hit points if you want to tank try it out i don't recommend rushing out and picking that one up anytime soon that was off the pile of shame as was immortals because that was our first extreme play of that game so that's two more down and again it's not not working Wait, it's 60, we were at, I didn't actually, my, my sound effect didn't work, but I, we're at 65 now, or what are we supposed to be at? I don't know, I'd have to check my uh, yeah. Excel spreadsheet where I'm tracking all of it. I anyway, to... the number in the corner may not be completely yeah. accurate. The point is, I got two games played. Yep. The, the pile is getting lower. It's supposed, it's going to jump up a bit soon too, though, so. We'll, we'll adjust it in the off season and we'll be back to yeah. get the right number <laughs> we'll next week. Back. <laughs> it's not getting a zero i don't think this year anyway so so now what we talked about what we played since the last update is there anything you're excited to get to the table next week well there will be two more expansions for dc on the list one i picked up uh while i was down in windsor and then i ran into an amazon sale not the one you suggested oh, okay but another discount on uh one of the ones i've been looking for and didn't think i was going to be able to get at a reasonable price um so i managed to pick up both uh, conflict or not, sorry, not conflicts rivals, uh, the first rivals, which is Batman Joker while I was down in Windsor. And then I picked up the, uh, villains United, uh, not villains United heroes United and villains unlimited. Um, but it's, uh, basically you play as villains, uh, Okay. but not, but not like the rogues where you're playing as the minor villains. No, this is the full on bad guys. Uh, and it was the original implementation of, uh, the victory points within the game, uh, okay. mechanic. So we'll see how that one plays out. Uh, personally, I need to get my Monday night game group uh, back together again. We've had a hard time getting the group together the last, actually the last couple months. Um, what I really want to do is get an RPG going. Uh, I'm not sure which one though. Like I'm really, really want to play some dungeon crawl classics, but I'm also uh, obviously affected by RPG a month. 
really tempted to try Shadows of the Demon Lord. Though really what I want for Shadows of the Demon Lord is I want our old Warhammer group back together to try that. Playing it with this group may not go over as well. But that's it. Mainly that's what I want to do. Uh, if that doesn't work, though, I do want to play Immortals again. So if I can't get the RPG group together, if we get enough people, I'll play a game of Immortals with them and give it one more shot. I'm telling you, you're making me you're making me want to dial in. I want to be the laptop at the table and and playing uh playing our old <laughs> playing the old war the old Warhammer uh style thing and I'll just be that head sitting on the laptop uh dialed in through Skype or something. Yeah, I don't know. We could try it maybe. I don't <laughs> know. We have such a hard time just trying to get our group together lately. I don't know. It's no one in particular's fault. It's yeah. it's parental issues. Uh the the one person has a cat and the cat just had kittens and the dad's rejecting the kittens, so he's having to stay home because the mom's not whatever yeah, we're grown-ups it's on. hard now it's yeah. just <laughs> adult adulting is hard um and then so the we other, mentioned yep yeah, the other we thing mentioned it at the top of the show uh sean had a blog post published on tabletopbellhop.com and i wanted to give him a chance to do a shout out for that i should have did that before the tabletop gaming weekly my bad for not putting it in the chat now we've already heard his thoughts on breakout con but there is a blog post to go with it yeah so uh, while we talked about this uh briefly on the breakout uh, wrap-up episode uh i did try to see as many of the breakout con panels as possible that was sort of my uh, beat for the weekend as it were uh, and I went through and tried to give a thorough explanation and discussion of both uh, what was talked about at all those panels and my thoughts for how it could have been improved and what could have been uh, what might be able to be done differently and better uh, for next year at breakout um, and my thoughts on uh, on everything that happened uh, throughout uh, two days of the panels at least I missed that third day uh, as well as uh, some photos of uh, panelists as well. And that can be found at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews. It's right below my Demon Lord's Companion review. It is The title is The Gaming Panels of Breakout Con. So we're getting near the end of the show. Things are about to wrap up. Any last words from the chat? Uh, so... Uh... And she games is uh, really looking forward to getting Immortals back on the table and, and feeling that, you know, you we just didn't play the game. Uh, no. And I think that's a pretty fair uh, statement. We didn't play Immortals. We played, uh, you know, something else. Yeah. <laughs> we we tried to play Wallenstein with a game that kind of looked like it with a cube tower, and that didn't work. And then we tried to play, I don't know, Risk, I think, with the stealing of cards. <laughs> I don't know what we were doing there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she was interested whether or not I, I would ever play Sentinels again, uh, because I, it was it was a rough go. It was absolutely mm -hmm. a rough go. And uh, it, uh, it I know it wasn't the best showing of the game. But again, I, this this goes back to the same as, as what happened with uh, Wasteland Express. Wasteland Express. You know, you know, it wasn't a great showing of the game, but I understand it wasn't a great showing of the game. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, I like the concept and the, and the idea enough that I'm more than happy to jump back in there. Whereas Immortals, no, it wasn't a great showing of the game, but I'm also not really that, wasn't really that interested in mm -hmm. what it was offering anyway. Right. So, you know, again, if I got hooked on Wallenstein, I might be willing to go back to Immortals, but uh, at this point, no, I'm, I'll pass. There is definitely a very different vibe between the two. The one guy's right there, that, it, that it's for Ameritrash fans and the fact that, there were a ridiculous number of combats, and it was back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, I think you were the one that pointed out one review, so it was an, a knife fight in a phone booth, and it did. It had that feel. It was crazy. Sorry, a five-person knife fight in a yeah. phone booth. Yeah, no uh, it, and it felt like that because Wallenstein Shogun, one of the things I like about it is you can only ever attack twice on your turn, and a lot of times you're not even necessarily going to do that, and I think there's only... Nah, I'm not, I'm not going to say it. You maybe only get like 12 possible attacks the whole game. It might even be less. It might be a couple more. But there's very limited in the number of times you can actually spread out and attack someone else, which is a big deal in that game. Whereas in this, it was like you could attack every turn if you wanted to lots of times. And if you lost some units, it's not that bad because they come back to life on the other side and you just attack again. And that very gave it a very different vibe from yep. Wallenstein Shogun. Yeah, no, I felt like there wasn't as much um, strategy that mm -hmm. was was required i, I felt like you yeah you know, just attack 
Yeah, it's like, you know, yeah, I'm going to try and plan this, but then my entire plans have been ruined because someone in a different world ruined my game. Um, yeah. And that was the other that was the other big problem. That card stealing mechanic um, really, really kind yeah, of it was frustrated weird. me I... because, again, someone on a completely different map could ruin your, you know, entire strategy for the day for that turn. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on, wrapping things up. And now a quick shout out and thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. I the misdirected Mark joined Phil, Chris, Bob, and Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, where they're going to talk games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, thanks for the question and stopping by this week. Graham Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks. Jeff Seuss, thanks, and let me know if there are any games you want me want to borrow for your wedding. William Fisher, thanks. And Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas, thank you. P.S. Goujon, thank you. Andrew Dace, D Andrew Dacey, thanks. Well, that was a double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Well, the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek under guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us. Hang around and join us in the Pedo Suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>